Alrighty, uh, this is obviously a sad day. Uh, sad for America, sad for the city of Dallas. Um, particularly tragic for the families of those officers who lost their lives. I mean, I'm, we, our hearts go out to the city of Dallas and to those families. I was with uh, Mayor Rawlings a week ago in Indianapolis at the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors. And, and like what Buddy Dyer in Orlando just went through, um, there but for the grace of God, it could have been any city in America. And we, um, here in this city, um, offer our prayers and uh, our condolences to those families that um, lost loved ones and to the Dallas Police Department who, and to the Dallas uh, Area Regional Transit Authority who lost officers. Now, make no mistake, uh, this was a calculated uh, massacre of law enforcement personnel. There is no other description of this. This was done by design. This was done with malice. This was done with hatred. This was done with intent. And there will be a price to pay. And for our officers, and for Chief Ward and I, whose job it is to make sure that those officers get home every night safely to their families, um, we are going to take the appropriate precautions to make sure that they are safe I was at District 2 this morning at 6.15 and at District 3 soon thereafter to just let them know that um, I have their back um, and that we will do whatever we have to do to make sure that they get home to their families safely. Um, it is a ugly time in America for a lot of reasons. Uh, there is a dynamic in this country that certainly I haven't seen in the 30 plus years that I have been in public life. There are reasons for that, um, but ultimately as a nation, uh, we've got to understand that violence is never the answer. And the only way you combat violence is with love. And for us as a department, uh, we will continue to do what we have done every day, uh, certainly in the 30 years that I've been here, and that is to continue to work to make sure that that bond between our community and the people that we serve, particularly communities of color, um, is strong, and that what happened in Dallas uh, doesn't happen here. Uh, but I can tell you that we are in an unusual place as, as a country. I don't think it is helped by some of the inflammatory rhetoric and the divisive rhetoric that we see uh, by some who aspire to run for president, candidate. I don't think it's helpful that the United States Congress has refused to act in any way, shape, or form on any type of efforts to reduce gun violence reduce the availability of guns to people who should not have them. Um, I think our community, and particularly our communities of color, um, we've got to strengthen that relationship, not just here in Tampa, but across America as well. And that relationship between police departments across this country and communities of color, uh, that work is a daily, daily effort. It's not something you do with one uh, training session. It's something that you do officer by officer, community leader by community leader, citizen by citizen, and we strive to do that here in Tampa. Uh, we are not perfect. Uh, there is always room for improvement. We strive for that every day under the leadership of Chief Ward, um, but ultimately we have got to understand that we are all Americans, uh, that we all uh, have a common destiny together, and a common obligation to hold each other up in very, very difficult times, this, and this is clearly one of them. Um, I think America will, just like they did two weeks ago in Orlando, um, at the attack on our LGBT community and our Hispanic community in Orlando, uh, that this country will rise up and say, enough of the violence. That is not who we are. Do we have challenges? Yes. Do we have problems in this country? Yes, we do. But violence is not the answer. And what occurred in Dallas, there is no excuse for. Those officers got up to do a job that we hired them to do, that they that they love to do. They love to go out and serve this community, keep this community safe, and to know that there was a target on their back and on the backs of officers all over this country is just unacceptable. And so those of us um, who are here, who are in positions of leadership, whether it's mayors or police chiefs around the country, um, have an obligation to, to grieve with the people in Dallas um, but we also have a moral obligation to do what we can to make sure uh, that this doesn't happen. And whatever bonds that have been broken uh, in this community, 
uh, that we repair them and we restore uh, what we know is good about America. So this is a really, really sad day uh, for the officers, uh, not just in Dallas, but for officers around the country. Um, we're going to protect our cops, pure and simple. And we're going to make sure that they get home every night to their families uh, safely and in one piece. That's all they ask. That's all they want. They want to serve their community and they want to come home at night. And there are six officers in Dallas who are not going home tonight. Chief. I would just like to start by saying that we're here in Tampa. We are grieving with those officers and their family members in Dallas. The loss, the senseless loss of those officers is something that uh, no chief ever wants to experience. We have put measures in place in Tampa to make sure our officers are safe and the community is, is safe as well. As we move forward in this healing process, um, we have a great relationship with our community. We can't do it without our community. We put measures in place over the last year that have strengthened that bond with our community. The relationship with our community can't be any better. Um, we're not perfect, but we're going to strive forward as we improve those relationships in matters that uh, concern our citizens. We've, we meet with our citizens on a regular basis to make sure that we hear their concerns. Our officers are out every day engaged in the community to make sure that we, as a law enforcement agency, are doing the right things. Ultimately, our job is to protect the community. Saying that, my goal is to make sure our officers have those resources they need to make sure that they're doing the job and they're safe and they're able to go home every night to visit their families as well. So as we move forward in this process, we're going to heal, we're going to heal together the community. Like I said before, there's nothing that can explain the tragic loss of those officers. Being targeted by an individual with his own motives, there's nothing that can explain that. These guys were out doing their job, trying to do the right thing, and were targeted by an individual with his own agenda. That can't happen in Tampa, and it will not happen, happen in Tampa. Thank you. All right. We'll take any questions. Chief, Chief, Chief I, Weaver. I have a question. Just simply, will you change the way we do things when it comes to protests? Maybe see protests as being our democracy having been that right to protest. Will your officers do things differently from now on? Well, our goal is to, you know, everyone has that um, right to freedom of speech. And we're going to do what it takes to protect the community as they exercise those rights. As long as those protests are peaceful, we're here in support. Um, we will only engage and be involved if those protests become violent. We respect those rights, and we're going to do what we can to accommodate those, those protests. Chief, can you, um, you heard from the Dallas Police Chief that, in, in his words, um, we need more support from the community. Um, do you see any of that here? Do you feel any need in, in this community for either more support or do you feel a lack thereof of support from the community in order for you guys to do your job? Um, I believe we have a support of the community. Uh, this morning I had several emails from members of the community, members that I respect, uh, that, that express their condolences for the loss of those officers. Uh, as we move forward, I think our relationship with the community is where it needs to be. Um, we're not perfect, and I'm sure there's, there's room for improvement, and that's the process that we're going to work through together. We're going to work through that as a team. You know, it's not law enforcement against the community. We will work together as a team uh, to make sure the city is strong. Is there anything your officers are going to change the way they, you know, do things on a daily basis? In light of this, is there anything that you see is even possible that could make a situation like that any safe? Well, our goal is always to get out in the community and engage in conversation. Uh, that's the only way we can figure out what's the pulse of the community. So the officers have been instructed to get out get out of the cars, engage the community, in a simple conversation. Uh, the community needs to know that these officers are human, and they have family members as well. And I think uh, moving forward, that process kind of strengthens that bond. Uh, we encourage our community to go through our Citizens Academy. It's an eye-opening experience. Uh, everyone thinks this job is easy, and those members that have been through our Citizens Academy have come out with a different perspective. What are you telling your officers today It's important that they understand that I have their back. And we're going to do our job. We're going to continue to do our job in keeping the city safe. I'm going to provide them with additional resources that uh, 
I think they need to keep them safe on a daily basis. Uh, we've instrumented, uh, instituted some um, deployment practices that I think is going to get us through this next you know, couple of days. Uh, and I think that's the key to moving forward. Chief, this is a question for you, and then perhaps I'd like to answer from the mayor as well. How much of this anger directed towards law enforcement officers do you think is the result of social media and the immediacy of video? We've seen you know, recently you know, a number of cases where whether it's body cameras video from an officer or cell phone video from a bystander shows graphic violence that we might have once heard about but not seen. So how much of this anger is the result of that? Well, I think a great deal of it is uh, social media. Something happens in Louisiana and in 24 hours is national news, uh, which has nothing to do with Tampa. And sometimes when that information gets put out, all law enforcement get painted with that same brush, which kind of affects what we're trying to do here in Tampa. I think our relationship with our community is strong. But when stuff like that gets put out, it kind of puts us, uh, makes us a step back, and puts us a step backwards. And ultimately, um, information that gets put out like that without having all the facts kind of hampers what we're trying to do. Mayor, it's a two-edged sword. You know, I'm sure you want transparency. You want people to know what's going on with law enforcement, and you like having the tools, knowing uh, what has happened. But again, we have this immediacy and perhaps not all of the information that goes along with it. So what do you think of that? Well, you know, the, 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 the challenge is in this environment that we find ourselves in now as a country, um, the immediate reaction to social media, absent a, a in-depth investigation of the facts, and, and the process will, will, will determine where the guilt lies. I mean, we know what we saw on the video in Minneapolis, and we know what we saw on the video in uh, Louisiana. But we don't know what led up to that. And, and as egregious as that looked, and it obviously when I saw it, I was like, uh, this, is, this is not good. But I don't know what happened in the moments before that, and I don't know what happened in the moments after that. And so there is a rush to judgment as a result of the immediacy of social media being out there in everyone's face. And it tends to inflame people uh, when the facts have not been determined. Now, if those officers that were involved in those cases did something inappropriate, then they deserve the full weight of the law being brought to bear. By the same token, they also deserve uh, the right to the facts and a right to a hearing and a right to an investigation. Um, that rush to judgment, I think, is not good for America. But bear in mind, like the question about the, uh, the protest, we don't have an issue with people expressing their First Amendment rights. What happened to Dallas was a decision of someone who is a cold, calculated killer, pure and simple, um, who used that march and used perhaps what had occurred in, in Louisiana and Minneapolis without knowing the full extent of the facts as a reason to take the lives of six Dallas police officers. So social media is a good thing, and we try to be as transparent as we can. And the evidence will speak for itself, but let the investigation take its place, and there will be justice delivered. I mean, that much I can promise you. There is nothing that good cops want any more than to get rid of bad cops. And so if there are folks who are out there who are doing things that are inappropriate or engaging in behavior that is unacceptable, then they deserve the full weight of the law being brought down to them. But let the, let the investigation take its toll. Um, and what occurred in Dallas is inexcusable in, in any regard. There are certainly no people who don't feel justice is being delivered even after they've seen the facts. And it's not just the two recent cases, mm -hmm. but Freddie Gray mm -hmm. and you know, a litany of other cases that we have seen. Maybe, what would you say to those people? Well, I would say that there are some who, who don't believe in the system, who, don't, who believe the system is rigged against them. Um, I can't speak to that. It is the system that we have in place. Um, are there improvements that could be made in policing and police practices around the country and police departments? Absolutely. I mean, these officers are human beings. First of all, they're going to make mistakes. They are human beings. They're going to make mistakes. Um, but I think you eliminate the likelihood of mistakes by, by the culture of the department, by the training that goes involved, um, by making sure you weed out the bad actors and those that are prone to those types of bad decisions or those who come to the job with biases. Um, a lot of it is training, but ultimately we have a judicial system that is the basic foundation of our Constitution. We have got to let the system take 
um, its appropriate role and come to the appropriate decision. And, that, and I think it's unfortunate that there are those who react immediately, uh, not knowing all of the facts, but just based on a, a snippet of video as, as egregious and as horrific as that video might be. And Chief, I just want to ask you a question that piggyback on the question about video. There are people of color who feel like the moment they see flight, Well, we don't have a problem with that. Uh, our officers, I'm confident that our officers are trying to do the right thing every day. Uh, so somebody capturing video doing a traffic stop doesn't intimidate us, doesn't concern us. We're very open and transparent. Uh, part of our process is making sure our officers are trained, well, well trained. So I put a big emphasis on the training of our police officers, putting them in those scenarios that could be volatile, so that their first encounter with law enforcement or encounter with our community, they've been through those situations and they know how to appropriately react to them. Uh, I think having these officers prepared for those types of scenarios, those situations, is the key. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what exactly is the training? How is an officer supposed to handle a cell phone in their face? We're all familiar with you know, the hand going up to the camera and knocking it away, and then you, are you encouraging officers not to do that anymore? Well, I don't think that was the practice. Uh, when you see an incident like that, that's something that we frown upon. You know, each citizen has the right to video record in public space. And uh, so having those videos out doesn't concern us. Um, making sure the officers are properly trained is what concerns me. And like I said, putting those officers in those situations, making sure that they've been trained properly, gets the job done. You know, that's, we don't fear transparency. Um, it helps us support good cops and helps us weed out bad cops. Um, that's why we're moving to the body cameras. Um, I mean, these are all things that help uh, good police officers do their job in the face of unwarranted accusations. Um, so we're not afraid of that at all. And if we find a behavior that's inappropriate or that's beneath the standards that we ex expect out of our officers, then, then we'll weed it out. So for us, a citizen with a cell phone camera or a police officer with a body camera only helps our officers do their job. So we're, we're, we, don't, we don't have any problem with that. Speaking of body cameras, I think there was a hope that more cameras sometimes creates a situation where people are less likely to do something that they might regret. Um, it's early in the implementation process, but can you talk, are you seeing any sort of change, whether from the public or from officers, about how they handle themselves? I mean, I know there's a way we're all supposed to, but be honest, how are, are, is there any change in habits uh, the way people are acting because of the increased presence of cameras on both sides? Well, I'm sure it's going to increase uh, the behavior of law enforcement, um, but I think the overwhelming increase is going to be in the public. Uh, there's been you know, complaints in the past uh, that have been cleared by body cam video, um, and when people see themselves in that body cam video, the story is totally different. So it's a double-edged sword. And the uh, majority of times, I'm, I'm here to tell you it's been positive for law enforcement. It's cleared a lot of allegations, um, so we're not afraid of it. And uh, we're, we're in a pilot program now, and as soon as we get our study back, I'm sure we're going to be moving forward. And one of the most valuable parts of those body cameras are is you get to see in very stark, real-life terms how dangerous it is out there on the street and what these officers go through every day. Uh, and the circumstances that they find themselves in and the situations that they have to deal with. I mean, those of us who haven't walked in their shoes can never fully understand what it's like out there on the streets today. Uh, the proliferation of guns, the propensity for violence, um, all of that, it, it, when it's captured on a body camera, it tells you an entirely different story and gives you a much greater appreciation for the men and women that are willing to go out there and be subjected to that every day and put their lives on the line every day just like those uh, Dallas police officers did. When we were picking up on that though, you know, legislatively a lot of the body cameras have been a big deal the last couple of years because of the tragedies in uh, Missouri and other places and yet we still have these incidences. So is, is there anything else legislatively you think that might stop the prevalence of these incidents that we had this week? I think getting guns out of the hands of bad guys 
getting uh, a Congress that would actually act on some measure of gun violence. I mean, these officers on the street, you know, are dealing with folks who are armed and who are inclined to use it, most of whom are not permitted to purchase a, a weapon. And so I think anyone who doesn't um, acknowledge the fact that there are too many guns on the street in the hands of the wrong people and that some appropriate um, gun violence prevention measures um, are needed um, is a fool. Um, go spend a day with a cop and then tell me that we need more guns on the street. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that, that we can do that, uh, that would be helpful if, if our friends in Washington and Tallahassee had the political um, fortitude uh, to, to do the right thing. And we realize that they don't work for the NRA, they work for the people who are working. Chief, um, you mentioned uh, implementing some deployment strategies uh, that are different that will carry you through the next couple of days. Could you be a little more specific about what those are? For, for instance, We've heard this morning that there are some communities that are moving away, at least for now, uh, from having single officers and, and patrol cruisers. Um, are you doing anything like doubling up? Or well, you know, the purpose of you know, changing our strategies and employment of our law enforcement officers is keeping them safe. So those are things that I won't talk about. Because when we put that information out, it is kind of defeated the purpose. Uh, the incident that happened in Dallas, it was uh, something that was calculated. And, uh, that had the intent to kill law enforcement officers. So uh, we're putting that information out on how we change and change our deployment in order to give the bad guy another hand. When you talk about trying to build a relationship with the community, how effective <coughs> has the um, citizen review board and even the DOJ review of the department over the past year, how effective have those things been, you think, in trying to establish a better relationship with the community? I think that the board had its purpose, and it's, uh, in my opinion, working as, a, as designed. Uh, we've had three community forums, uh, one in each district that was open to the public. And I had an opportunity to hear their concerns, um, both positive and negative. And from those community forums, uh, we went back and redeveloped a strategy on how we can better strengthen our relationship. And as a result, I think we're moving in the right direction. Sure. If I could give some just briefly historical perspective. Um, I was the assistant to the mayor in 1987. And I was out there at uh, Lake and 29th, 22nd Street during the disturbances. Eric was probably out there too, but he was on the streets. Um, I was out there when we went through what we saw Baltimore go through, although to a lesser degree. Um, and that's been 30 years almost. And from that day forward, I think this community made a conscious decision that we were never going to let that happen again in our city. And we saw the same kind of violence, the rock and bottle throwing, the stores being burned, um, as a result, largely of young African-American men dying in police custody. Very similar circumstances to where we find ourselves in this country today. Um, Sandy Friedman, the mayor at the time, and every mayor since then has made it a priority that we never, as a community, get to that point where the boiling point was that close to the surface and the tension was that, was that significant. Um, it has been 30 years in the making. We will be at this for as long as we have a police department and we have a community. Um, it is not something that's solved uh, overnight. Um, it is something that is built on decades of relationships between police officers and the communities that they police and they patrol. Um, I think this department has improved light years from the department that existed in 1987. Uh, we got rid of a lot of bad cops. Uh, we changed the way we police. We changed the culture. We changed the expectations. We made it a priority that everyone be treated with the dignity that they deserve, whether they're the mayor or whether they're a homeless person. And I think over those 30 years, we have gotten better and better and better and better. Now, we're not perfect. As long as you're dealing with human beings in these circumstances, as those who protect and those who are protected, you're always going to have a dynamic. On any given night, in any given city in America, something like this could happen. But I think it's those decades of work on that issue and those relationships that have allowed us to, to, to survive um, and to grow and to not have these types of circumstances. Do we have incidents? Absolutely we do. 
Absolutely we do. We, are there bad people in the community uh, that would kill a cop in a heartbeat? You bet there are. Are there cops who will make the wrong decision and who have biases? You bet there are. They're human beings. But I think this community has done so much more over uh, the last 30 years to get to this point. Um, but I will tell you this, like any city in America, we have a whole lot more to do. We have a whole lot more to do. And I know under Chief Ward's leadership, uh, this department is going to continue to do that. And I think this allows us to sustain and withstand whatever the national pressures are and the national um, uncertainty and unease that's occurring elsewhere. Because they're only now figuring out that they got a problem. And they're only now starting to implement uh, changes that would correct that. You cannot correct that overnight. You can't fix Ferguson overnight. You can't fix Baltimore overnight. That is decades of institutional poverty, of bad race relations, of income inequality, of, of violence. Um, that You can't fix that in one year, in one mayor's term, or one police chief's term. That takes decades. And fortunately, we started in 1987. And we will continue, certainly as long as he's the chief and I'm the mayor, to continue to build on that, to acknowledge our weaknesses, uh, to point out our flaws, to correct them, to remind the community of their moral obligation to support these men and women who are out there putting their lives on the line for them. Um, in our community, I think the majority of the community that looks at the cops as allies and not enemies. I can't say that for other cities. That was not a person, that was a killer. And I'm not going to dignify his existence. That was a stone cold killer who made a calculated decision to shoot six police officers and wound another five more. There is no rationale for that. You may be angry, you may be upset, you may in your, in your universe think that you're doing something good, but ultimately you took six lives of people who were out there to protect you and your rights. Um, so there's no excuse for what took place there. There's no societal uh, justification for what occurred in Dallas, Texas. And so Dallas is a good city. I know the mayor. They've moved light years from where they once were. Uh, but that was a decision by a cold uh, killer uh, to do that. And, and he got exactly what he deserves. Chief did. Chief, can you say anything about um, your community policing strategies and whether incidents we've seen over the last few weeks when you say you talk about the officers going out there and bonding you know more with uh, people they serve can you talk about the program specifically and whether you, you know you feel you want to make any tweaks to that or whether it's working well in terms of the community policing strategy well absolutely I, th I think that we're moving in the right direction you know, we partnered up with the grades and we started a program called cpr connect protect and respect this gives the office officers an opportunity to get out of the cars and engage the community it's working for us. Uh, the kids know we have these vouchers, so it creates that dialogue with the officers, which is our ultimate goal. We want the community to see these officers as human, so getting out of the car and engaging in conversation when there's no crime going on is the key. And I think uh, it's been working. It's been working for us. You mean vouchers for tickets? Yes, right? absolutely. Mayor, can you talk about Mayor Rawlings and, and just, I don't know if you have any 